Hi everybody. My name is Ali and I'm from Maine's Confetti Quail Farm. And I'm going live for the first of a few or probably a lot of live videos that we're going to be adding to the Caternix Corner YouTube video. I'm going to be streaming these originally on um, the Caternix Corner Facebook group page. So hopefully you guys can see me. Hopefully you can interact with comments. <clears throat> Please let me know if you have a hard time hearing me or anything's not working correctly for you. Um, but this new series that we're doing was actually inspired because Terry uh, has reached out to me and we've been talking for probably the last couple of weeks or so about each of the Caternix quail mutations so he can get a better grasp on color genetics. And um, this, I think, this is something that people have a, a harder time getting into and really understanding because it is a complex complex type of thing to to really grasp it actually took me about six months or so hi nick six months or so of being a newbie um hanging out in the colors and genetics group and every single day i read every single post in that group and for about six months i really didn't know you know what was going on i didn't understand any of the terms any of the mutations nothing really made sense to me until about that six month mark so it does take time to learn about the different mutations, how each of them works, how they interact with each other. So we figured that this would be a good opportunity to jump into this group and start from the very beginning, foundation level understanding, um, and opportunity for you guys to ask questions and to um, look at some reference photos that I'm going to be adding to the comments section of or the comments of the particular posts that I'll put on here for you. And we can have a continuing discussion about the genetics and the topics that I cover in these videos. So today, the quail color and genetics chat, this is number one. And I'm not sure how many we're gonna have, but probably quite a few. Um, my goal is to talk briefly have these be shorter videos with q a at the end but shorter videos to really break down in the simplest way that i can each mutation and then we'll start getting into um, different varieties of combinations of mutations later on so this one is going to be the intro to the bases topic so hi hi terry so when I say the word bases, this is a general term. And I want to say from the very beginning, I am not an expert. I do not have a background in biology, genetics, nothing like that. I'm just a background, a backyard breeder. And I've been breeding quail for about two years now. And I've just gone kind of face first into the color breeding aspect of it. And this is, from my perspective, the best way that I can relay information to people who are brand new. Um, and I want this to be content that uh, everybody can digest in smaller bits. And it's not going to be um, so heavy that anybody feels like it's over their heads. Okay. Hello, Klaus. So I'm going to, at the end, of what I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna to try to go back through the comments and pick out the questions that you guys leave. If you would be so kind and put a cue in front of your questions, that will make it easier for me to go back and um, pinpoint where I need to, to give you more information or elaborate on specific things or simplify specific things for you. So there's no question that's too silly Please feel free to post anything that you feel like you want to. Um, and hopefully this is something that your kids can even follow along. And that's my goal for this. So we'll also be sharing these on the YouTube channel. Yes. Thank you, Terry, for that. Hopefully they're helpful and hopefully they're clear. Now, before we jump in, I did want to also mention that this um, 
colors and genetics with Caternix Quail is something that is an ongoing process as far as us trying to understand each of the mutations, each of the genes, where they're located, how they work with, with each other. Um, and there's still a lot of gray area. There's uh, holes that need to be filled, gaps within our knowledge. So this is the best uh, information that I can give you kind of off the cuff. I'm not gonna be working from notes or anything like that. Um, but the best information that I can give you based on what is current knowledge or current belief having to do with each mutation. Um, <clears throat> in groups, there's a lot of people in here and sometimes it can be hard to navigate, you know, who, who maybe understands the genetics more so. I'm going to throw out some names of some people who I really think are experts in this. I did not ask them permission to do this ahead of time, so hopefully it's okay. But if I am corrected or if I misspeak about something or if I um, use the wrong word or wrong term or what I'm saying is incorrect, I hope that those people and others will pop in to the comment section and correct me. Um, and some of the names of those folks that I would, you know, perk your ears up to if they do end up commenting on these videos is Michael Rose from Southwest Game Birds, Naomi from Kansas City Quail, Tamara from Calgary Quail, Katya from um, My Extraordinary Quail, William Foster from uh, K. Dale Caternix. There's some other ones, there's some other ones. There was another one. Oh, Klaus, Klaus from Paradise Quail, and uh, Dana Manchester, of course, and um, Martin Yardley, okay? So if, the, if any of those people pop into the comments and they say, Ellie, you know, it's fact-checking you, listen up because we're gonna default to those guys because they, they are the experts here. So we're gonna talk about bases, the term bases. The terms for Caternix quail genetics, unfortunately, is not up to up to speed, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, than breeding, let's say, other d different types of poultry like chickens, guinea fowl, turkeys, ducks, things like that. There's a lot more precise terminology when people are breeding those uh, types of poultry versus the Caternix quail. We have kind of been coming together and using our own way of talking about things. And bases is one of those general terms that we'll use. And it's not necessarily scientifically accurate. But again, my goal here is to give you a foundation of understanding so you can navigate your flock in your backyard and you'll be able to um, have enough information where you know what you're working with and you'll be able to um, design your breeding programs in a way that you're producing birds that are predictable as far as their appearance goes. So bases, traditionally, correct me if I'm wrong, poultry people, but traditionally bases for poultry are genes that are uh, located on the MC1R locus, okay? Now, for Caternix, we use the MC1R locus, also known as the E locus, as that spot where we say, okay, that gene is a base. That gene is there, that's the location of that gene, we're gonna call it a base. But there are some, some there is some wiggle room there with Caternix. <clears throat> Another gene location that I'm going to talk about is ASIP gene, and that's where the fawn locus is. So just for, for the ease of explanation, I'm going to refer to um, bases that are the wild type base, EB, which is also known as extended brown, also known as extended black, but I'm going to refer to it probably most of the time as extended brown or EB. The fawn gene, which is not on MC1R, it's on ASIP location-wise. I'm gonna mention calico as a base. I'm going to mention pansy as a base. Pansy may or may not technically be a base, but for these videos, I'm going to refer to it as a base. And I'm going to refer to sparkly as a pattern modifier. 
Okay, guys. So again, take my way of, exp of, of, of how I'm going to explain things to you as just that. It's just my way that I understand. It's the way that I can talk to people in a conversation and hopefully get the information to you in a way that, that makes sense. So <clears throat> the first one that I want to talk about is the wild type base or pharaoh. Those two terms, those two names, use them interchangeably. Um, what this is, is actually the Caternix quail with a lack of any other mutations on that bird. So visually, genetically, there's no other color mutations there. It's just a clean, sorry, I was getting a phone call. Uh, it's just a clean canvas. So this is one of those things that I'm going to say that's not scientifically correct, but for the purposes of understanding color breeding, I'm going to refer to a bird that is pharaoh or wild type as having two copies of wild type or pharaoh genetically. Again, reiterating that pharaoh and wild type is actually the lack of all other mutations. Please understand that. But moving forward, when I talk about one or two copies of wild type or one or two copies of pharaoh, that's just going to help me better explain how to make different combinations and varieties later on. So when you're looking at a bird, a wild type or feral bird, that is the basic brown with the gold um, kind of flex within those back feathers, the typical mask that you see. <clears throat> I'm gonna add reference photos in the comments section, so I'll be sure to put feral there. But on Terry's Tumblr, this is what we're talking about, feral, wild type. Okay, um, your basic jumbos. That's what that pattern is on that bird, that feather, that plumage pattern, how the pattern on the feathers look. Now, <clears throat> most commonly in the United States, we do not have clean feral to work with because most of the feral lines that we have access to are production lines and they are also mixed with the sex link brown gene, which is a diluter gene. And we'll talk about that in a whole other video. Um, it has been talked about in several of Terry's um, additional YouTube videos as well. But just know that within the United States, it's really tricky to get your hands on, if, if possible at all, to get your hands on a clean feral line, meaning a Caternix quail that has no other mutations present. Typically, you're going to have sex link brown to work on or work with, and you'll have to put work into that line to take out that sex link brown if you want to have that clean feral base, clean canvas. Now, if you guys have questions about the pharaoh, you can feel free to post them as I'm talking. <clears throat> but another one of the bases, actually, I don't think I mentioned this in the very beginning, but we're gonna technically call this a base, and we're going to only chat about it for a couple minutes, and I'm not gonna make an extra video on it, but there is a gene, uh, or it's a recessive black is what it's called. And it's a recessive gene, and it's also on the MC1R locus, so technically a base. But the recessive black is a gene, I think, that's only really uh, found in laboratory settings. It's not one that you're going to likely have in your backyard uh, flocks at all. But technically, we'll add that to the MC1R list of bases. So the next one is... This is when we start adding different mutations, different base pattern mutations on top of that feral base. You will never have a bird that does not have the foundation of feral. We add different mutations to it to change the appearance. So the next base pattern that I wanna to talk to you about is the extended brown. So extended brown, also known as EB, this is what we can add on top of Faro as either one copy or two copies of that EB, and it will create your Rosetta, that would be one copy of EB, and your Tibetan, which would be two copies of EB. Now, the EB gene is on MC1R, locus-wise. I hope that the 
term locus and MC1R isn't overwhelming. It's important to note though, because birds have only specific, um, the ability to, to hold only a certain amount of genes on each locus. So MC1R is, I believe, only able to hold two genes in addition to the bird being wild type pharaoh. So <clears throat> a bird can have one or two copies of EB if that's the only other gene that's, that's on there. You could have additional genes layered onto that EB, but if it's a homozygous EB, meaning there's two copies of extended brown on that bird, those two spots on that, one, on that MC1R locus location is taken up. So you would have to have, if you, if you have a bird that has more on it than just homozygous EB, which would be your Tibetan, that gene would have to have a location that is not MC1R. Okay, I hope that makes sense. It will make more sense the more we talk about it later. So Rosetta heterozygous EB, Tibetan is homozygous EB. <clears throat> the next base that we'll mention today, and I think that that's probably gonna be the last one that we talk about today, because I wanna give you guys little bits and pieces, is fawn. So fawn is, we're going to say a base pattern because it's so dominant in the way that it acts and the way that it looks appearance-wise on a bird, um, <clears throat> that we're gonna call it a base. It is on ASIP for the lo location, the locus, of that gene, that's where it is, the ASIP. So one copy of fawn on a pharaoh or on a wild type gives you your Italian. And the fawn gene is what's responsible for giving you that gold plumage color. The patterning of a heterozygous fawn bird is going to be different than a wild type pharaoh bird because again, it's a different base pattern. So if you have one copy of fawn on pharaoh, it's an Italian bird, and I will list, or I'll share a reference photo of what an Italian hen and what an Italian rooster looks like in the comment section. Um, it's going to be gold in color, and it's going to be feather sexable, also, wild type is feather sexable, but it's gonna be feather sexable the same, the same way that wild type is. Hens are gonna have speckled chests, males are going to have clear chests, and you'll see the uh, majority of the patterning along the back. They will also have face masks. The males will also have face masks. You'll see in the pictures um, that I'll add. But just as a note too, to kind of go back a little bit, um, EB, extended brown, is not feather sex bowl. Sorry, I didn't mention that before. Um, <clears throat> but a bird that has two copies of fawn, that's going to be your Mancharian. So one copy of fawn, Italian, two copies of fawn, Mancharian. The phenotype, meaning the appearance, the pattern appearance of a bird that's homozygous for fawn, Mancharian, is going to be different than the phenotype or appearance of an Italian. It's changing that plumage pattern, not just the color. That's what, that's how I, I differentiate for the most part, the difference between a base pattern and the difference between a diluter gene, right? They, the base patterns will change the pattern or alter the pattern and the diluter genes will, um, change the color of the plumage, but will leave, for the most part, leave the pattern, the base pattern alone. So you're welcome. Hi, Brooke. Hi. So those are the ones that I would love for you to um, get comfortable with as far as being able to visually identify. So here's your checklist. Be able to visually identify Pharaoh. Italian, which is heterozygous, fawn. Manchurian, which is homozygous, fawn. A uh, heterozygous EB, which is your Rosetta. And a homozygous EB, which is your Tibetan. Um, all of those pictures I will list for you here. Every bird is going to have 
a base pattern of some kind. Um, and that will be the first thing that you really look at when you're trying to uh, look at a bird that has a lot of stuff going on and try to understand what it is that's going on within that bird. It's the base pattern that you're gonna be looking at first. So, let's see. Oh, there is something else that I wanted to talk about. And that is how um, EB and how fawn are compatible. So there's one more term that I'm gonna to toss at you today, and that is fawn enhancement. So since EB and fawn are located in different places, right? They're not on the same locus. They can exist together on the same bird. So you could have a rosetta, meaning a pharaoh with one copy of EB, and you can also have that bird have one copy of fawn because they're on two different locusts. So you visually would have, in that case, you would have a fawn enhanced rosetta. You could also have a fawn enhanced Tibetan. The same reason, the two different genes are located in two different spots, so there's places for both EB and fawn to exist on one bird. Phenotype-wise, it will change the bird, and you typically can see on a EB bird if it is fawn enhanced. What it will do is it will add this kind of a jagged marking horizontally that goes across the feathers of the EB base. Um, I will also grab pictures of a fawn enhanced EB, and I'll put that in the, the reference photos in the comments as well. Um, so I think we're gonna leave the chat today here, and I, well, leave my chat here, and then I'm gonna go through and I'll answer any questions that you guys might have. If you do have questions, please feel free to post them, but also um, try to keep them relevant to the topic of the video so I don't step, or so I don't jump ahead into other mutations because we will definitely get there. For Terry and the rest that will help together. Okay, sorry, I'm just gonna scroll for a minute just to see. All right, here's a question from Terry. I'm sure a lot of people would like to know how to tell X -link, uh, uh, sex link brown from a pharaoh. Good question. So <clears throat> visually, sex link brown, we'll, we'll talk about, well, we can talk about sex link brown here. Maybe we won't do another video on sex link brown, but on a pharaoh, sex link brown will, it's a diluter gene. So it's going to, uh, I'll say add a certain type, a certain enhanced warmth color wise to your ferro base. It's going to make it more reddish brown, more vibrant in color, but it's also, it can be on um, the males as either heterozygous or homozygous. If your male is homozygous, meaning it's two copies of sex link brown gene, it's going to have that really dark brown face mask. If it's heterozygous, meaning only one copy of sex link brown, it's going to hide. So you're not going to see it on your males as, as you would if it was a homozygous for sex link brown. On hens, hens can have one copy of sex link brown. Um, I'm pretty sure. If I'm wrong there, an expert needs to jump in right now and correct me. My understanding is that sex link brown, a female can be hemi, hemizygous for. So here's another term that um, you can digest today. Hemi, hemizygous is when, I'll say in this case, the female only has one spot for a particular gene to fill. And I'm saying this the simplest way that I can. It only, a female will only have one spot for sex link brown to be. So it cannot be heterozygous and, and just have one copy and then hide it like a male can. It will have one copy if it has it and you will visually see it on a hen. The males are different. So <clears throat> to keep it really simple, 
When you're looking at a male, look for the face mask. And also you're going to see this kind of X shape that goes down the back that is going to be diluted more red. And you're gonna likely be able to see that from the shoulders crossing down under the wings. And the other place that it's really noticeable is that there's a band at the back of the neck for sex link brown birds that are homozygous for sex link brown, specifically males. If they're hemizygous, they've got one copy. If they're females, you'll see that band on the back of the head and it's a diluted band. Let's see if you're, no, your mug doesn't show it, but I'll put additional pictures of that as well. But those are the things to look for. A note on that though is if you don't have clean pharaoh in your flock and you're not looking at a sex link brown next to a clean pharaoh it's it's going to be it's going to be trickier to be able to know what it is exactly you're looking at so again reference photos tamara has some amazing clean pharaoh photos too that i hope she puts under there and so does katya um but that's going to be, if you're trying to take sex link brown out of your breeding projects, that's going to be something that's going to take generations for you to do. And if you have a flock that has sex link brown all through it, uh, it can be very, very difficult, if not impossible to, to get that out. Um, it's an ongoing process here. I'm on generation three of my pharaohs still working on it, but I do have some clean pharaohs that I can share pictures of with you. So it is possible if you've got at least one bird in your pharaohs that uh, is heterozygous for sex link brown and not homozygous. If it's a rooster, it's gonna make your process a lot easier. So um, sex link brown too, you can also see it on birds that are, uh, that are fawn. You can see it on EB, you can see it on um, even diluters. So if you've got different diluter genes on top of those base patterns, you'll be able to see it. I have not been able to really see it on pansy because pansy has that red head anyway. Um, and I'm still in the process of identifying it when it's on calico. So again, this is one of those ongoing things. In the United States, we're just kind of getting into taking the sex link brown out of our of our flocks. So hopefully we'll have a lot more pictures of this is what this base is with sex link brown, this is what it is without sex link brown. Um, keep photos of your breeding projects so we can keep sharing them here and we can kind of compare what we're working with. Um, whoops. Let's see. Hopefully I'm not missing anything. Let's see. Brooke is gonna watch this later. Can't wait till you confuse people with calico. <laughs> oh, you just wait. Okay, I think that's it. I don't see any questions yet, but if you do have any later after you've watched the replay, please put them under the comments of this video that's posted in the Caternix Corner Facebook group because this is where I'm gonna be looking for things and probably likely other people will be seeing them. I'm not sure if it's gonna be as easy to find your comments if it's on the YouTube channel um, comment area. So if you can put them here, it's much more likely that I'll get to them and I'll see them. Okay, so next video. Next video, we'll talk about another base pattern and then we'll get into the uh, mutation that I consider being a pattern modifier, which is sparkly. I'll say right off the bat, sparkly may technically be a base uh, because of where it's located locus wise. But um, for future videos, I'm going to be referring to sparkly as a pattern modifier just for ease of explanation. So I am looking forward to talking to you guys again very soon. And I hope you guys have a great day and I'll chat later. Bye.